and welcome this afternoon. Welcome everyone to uh, our session on screencasting in your online or web enhanced course. Um, I'm Dave Giberson. I'm uh, an old retired instructional design coordinator from Online Learning Pathways at the district. Uh, and they've asked me to come back and do a little consulting uh, in this time of unusual uh, circumstances we find ourselves in. So it's great to see you all this afternoon. Thank you for coming. Um, we've gone over some Zoom basics already, so uh, please let me know if you have any more questions about that vis-a-vis uh, -vis attending this meeting. I would ask you, if you wouldn't mind, to use the chat tool that we described earlier and put your name and your email address in the chat tool, if you wouldn't mind. That'll give me a roster when I'm done. I'll know how many people uh, came through today. And um, let's get started on our discussion of screencasting. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen much of the time, so let me start that now. Thank you for putting that in. And whoops, that's not the screen I'm going to have up there. Let's see, what did I do with that? There it is. Okay, here's our course outline for today. Pretty simple. We'll start off by talking about what screencasting is. And that's not going to take long because there's it's an exceptionally simple concept, both in uh, understanding and in execution. Uh, then we're going to talk about some things you can do with screencast with the technique of screencasting. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but it's some of the more common things that we might do with a screencast. And then we'll talk about the process of making screencasts, and we'll look at that through the lens of three either very inexpensive or, to you, free tools that you can use to make screencasts. And then we'll talk about one that's not free, <laughs> but that is the, uh, the best tool of all for a variety of reasons. We won't go into great detail on that because that is something most people are much less likely to have available to them. But, um, I do want to at least show you some of the things that can be done with that tool that you can't do with some of the free and inexpensive ones. So, what is screencasting? Well, it's a really simple idea. Um, you, a screencast is a multimedia presentation, a video, if you will, that is that involves recording your computer screen. Whatever is appearing on your computer screen is recorded <coughs> in full motion. So if things are changing on your computer screen, if windows are appearing and disappearing, or if um, you're working your way through a process in a piece of software or something like that, the process is recorded, the motion, any motion that takes place on the screen is recorded. In addition to that video, we all, uh, generally, not always, but generally screencasts also include audio. Usually your voice explaining whatever is going on on your screen. Um, though you can record audio produced through your computer as well in most screencasting tools. So if you play a, a music video or, a, or if you play a, a music file or a video on your screen while you're recording with the screencasting tool, you can record both the, the uh, video and the audio that is coming out. The, the audio that comes through your computer speakers is recorded as well, if you so choose, in, most, in all of these screencasting tools indeed. Um, simple idea, but what it produces is a, an instructional video or potentially instructional video that 
is more or less equivalent to your student being able to stand behind you while you're explaining something to them using your computer and listening to you explain it. Screencasting allows you to record that interaction and then put that recording online so that the student can view that recording anytime they want, as many times as they want. They can start it and stop it. They can fast forward through it or rewind to something they didn't quite get. That makes screencasting an incredibly powerful instructional tool. There's not much you can't teach with a little bit of imagination in a screencasting tool. And the students can view it again and again and again on their own time, on demand. That translates to incredible instructional power, particularly in situations where you're not actually meeting your students face to face. It's useful under any circumstances because students can always use to go back over something that you said in class or uh, use extra help on difficult concepts in your course. But screencasting is a particularly valuable tool in online and web enhanced courses where at least some of the instruction is taking place remotely or as in our case right now, all of it is taking place remotely. So screencasting is just an amazing tool for that. Um, basic idea, very simple. Um, there are all sorts of things you can do with screencasts. You can create software tutorials. You can show your students how to navigate your Canvas course, for instance. That's a very common use around here to uh, help them find things and explain how the course works and so on, where they're supposed to go, where they're supposed to start and how to proceed and so on. Uh, just five minutes of that can make a tremendous difference for a student's comfort level in a Canvas course. Or you can show them how to do something in Word that they need to do or how to use a piece of software that is unique to your course by just using it yourself and talking about what you're doing and recording all that so that the student can play, back, play it back later and hear it and see it just as well as they would have if they were standing in your office when you made the recording. Another real common use of screencasting is PowerPoint narrations. Sure, you can, if you're uh, teaching an online or a web enhanced course, you can put your PowerPoint slides online by uploading them to Canvas and putting a link to them in a module. And the students can view your slide deck. But most of the information that's delivered during a PowerPoint presentation is not on the slides. Let's face it, it's in your narration of those slides. A Screencast or screencasting tool will allow you to capture that narration and the slides so that the students can not only see the slides but hear what you have to say about them. And that makes a PowerPoint presentation at least three times, or a narrated PowerPoint presentation is at least three times as useful as just having the slides themselves because most of the information is in the narration. Uh, related to that, you can do lecture capture. Anything that appears on your computer screen can be recorded. So when you're giving a lecture in class and you're using your laptop and a projector to show your students uh, things up on the wall, you can capture that if you fire off a screencasting tool that um, uh, is designed to capture your screen and your voice. So the student can play back an entire lecture that way. And everything except maybe what you write on the whiteboard and uh, anybody who's been through one of my Zoom uh, seminars knows that there's a, there's a whiteboard equivalent that you, can, uh, that you can record in the same way where you can bring the image uh, of, of a document camera up on your screen 
and record that through a screencast. Yeah. So you can capture complete lectures this way. And one of the more, one of the really interesting ways to, uh, to use a screencast is to provide feedback to students on homework assignments that they turn in through Canvas or by other means, uh, even if they turn it on paper, you can bring the assignment up on your screen, either using a camera or just open Word or whatever they provided you with a file, and you can work your way through the writing assignment. You can mark it up with various annotation tools that are available, or just highlight sections of it while you're talking about them. And provide the student the kind of individualized feedback that would re otherwise require each and every one of them to schedule office hour time with you and walk in and go over their paper individually. Well, you can do that virtually with a screencast by bringing the paper one way or another up onto your computer screen and talking about it. And then providing the student with that kind of detailed feedback. Again, an exceptionally important instructional tool because the student learns far more from dynamic feedback like that than they would from some blue marks on the paper. Um, so all of these, and that's just a smattering of things that you can do with screencasting. You're really limited only by your imagination as to what you can do with a screencast. Anything you can pull up on your computer screen, you can record and talk about it at the same time. And as I say, there's really not much you can't teach that way. So the um, uh, screencasting can be an, an amazingly useful tool. So let's talk about the nuts and bolts of how to do that. Uh, well, there are a num quite a few software tools that will allow you to record your computer screen in full motion and a voiceover behind it. We're going to stick mostly to tools that are either free or exceptionally inexpensive because they're quite good. <laughs> There's no need to spend a whole lot of money on a screencasting tool. Uh, you can get excellent results without doing that. Camtasia down at the bottom here is another matter, but that I include it not because of its screen recording capability, but because of its editing capability. The screen recorders and these other tools are just as good as the ones in Camtasia. So, questions before we move on. I see one in the chat tool. Very good, from Elizabeth. Let me make sure that's, yeah, the only one there. Uh, whoop, went right past it. How do students get to the recording? Uh, excellent question. Um, the recording will be posted somewhere online. I couldn't have paid you for this question to come at this just this moment. Thank you. <laughs> the, student, the recording has to be put somewhere online. You could upload it to Canvas, but we strongly recommend against that in most cases because Canvas is not that great a video server to start with. A and B, you have limit, a limited amount of uh, file space available in your Canvas course. It wouldn't take you very long to fill it up with screencast files, which are fairly large files. So our strong recommendation is that you put your videos up on the screencast videos that you make up on YouTube. YouTube is free. There's no limitation on how much you can use it, how many videos you can put up there, how many times they can be played. It's exceptionally reliable. It's exceptionally compatible with just about every kind of uh, internet connected display device you can imagine from smartphones to computers. So it's the ideal place to store and serve video from on the web. And again, for you, it's totally free. 
And that's the first thing I want to talk about. That's not in the outline here. I had, did have that kind of that part of it kind of uh, merged in with the rest of this, but I think it's worth going ahead and talking a little bit about YouTube first. Because the content that we create from each of these tools is going to end up on YouTube. So let's see how to do that. Uh, here's YouTube. And um, the usual mixture of <laughs> wild mixture of stuff that you find on YouTube. At least most of it is not obscene <laughs> by most anybody's standards. They work very hard to avoid that. And uh, some of the, a lot of it's frivolous, but hey, uh, gotta have fun too, right? But there's a tremendous amount of useful instructional content on there. From everybody from, uh, from opposite ends of the instructional spectrum, everybody from me to Stanford, MIT, <laughs> Berkeley. So uh, quite, a, quite a range there. So how do you use YouTube? How do you get a YouTube account? Well, if you've already if you already use any Google services, the chances are you already have a YouTube account. If you use Gmail, or if you use Google Docs, or Google Translate, or Google, what are all the possibilities? Google Music, um, just the, that bewildering variety of tools that Google makes available for free online. If you, have, if you use any of those, you already have a Google account. And if you have a Google account, you have a YouTube account. It's the same thing, same account. One Google account spans all of their tools. If you don't, you can very easily go to accounts.google.com and sign up. And here are, here are the just the bewildering variety of things. Google Maps, uh, the, just a wild variety of stuff that Google provides for free. Uh, in exchange for your, some of your personal data, but you can minimize what they collect in that regard. Um, if you don't have, when you, if you go to this URL, accounts.google.com, and you don't have an account at Google, you'll be prompted to sign up for one. It's a process that takes maybe five minutes. Google will ask you for a cell phone number. It'll text you back a code. You verify that you're a person instead of a robot and uh, you're ready. You, you give Google an email address to use as a username. Doesn't have to be a Gmail account. And um, you set a password and you're ready to go. And when you do, you have a YouTube account. If when you first come into YouTube, I should have signed out earlier. When you first come into YouTube, you'll be prompted with a sign in button in the upper right hand corner of the screen. Again, this is just youtube.com. So it's like the third most commonly visited site on the internet. So <laughs> your web browser will know where it is. Just type, start typing Y-O-U and it'll pop right up in your address line here. Um, you'll then be asked to sign in. So you sign in with your Google account credentials. This computer knows all about me, so it already has my credentials saved. But normally you'd be presented with a, a login dialog where you have a, you put in the email that you used when you're, for your Google account and the password that you set. I'm just going to sign in as me. It's going to make me enter my password anyway to make sure it's me. Uh, yeah, that's fine. I haven't signed in lately. I've been continuously signed in, so it just asked me to do that. Okay, so now I'm signed in to YouTube. I know that because of this little circle up here in the upper right hand corner of the YouTube website. Uh, I've got a, 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 an image, a profile image uploaded to my Google account. If you don't have that, you'll just see a little silhouette here 
it works just as well. You don't have to have a profile image there. Um, and you're ready to go. To upload a video to YouTube, all you have to do is click on this little camera icon here, which will be on just about every YouTube screen. And you just click on that camera and you have an option to upload uh -huh. video. You then go through a process, a uh, uh, series of screens that Google just leads you through by the hand. You don't have to remember anything. Uh, here you're told to select the video file that you want to upload. Um, I've got some videos here. Let me see if I can find one that I maybe haven't uploaded before. Because if I try to upload one twice, it, it gets irritated with me. I'll try that one. Okay. The one thing you have to do on this next screen is provide YouTube with a name for the video. I don't know what that is. <laughs> uh, you may also have to tell them, no, it's not made for kids. If you haven't, if this is the first time you've uploaded something, it won't have that filled in automatically. So you'll, you'll have to click that radio button that says no. And by kids, they mean somebody younger than 13. Click next. Oh, it looks like it, it's already uploaded in the time I've been blathering about it. Then you click next to go through the process. This next screen here, there's nothing you have to do. This is kind of window dressing. You just don't worry about it for now. Click next. On the last screen under visibility, you have to tell YouTube how visible you want this document or this video to be. Do you want anyone to be able to see it and search for it? in which case you make it public. That's great if you think it's something that might be interesting to someone else out there and you just never know what's gonna be of interest to someone else. And if it's, there's no con nothing confidential in it, you don't mind it being out there for the public, by all means make it public. It's more usual though to make it unlisted, which means Anybody can play the video, but they can't play it unless you give them the link to it, the URL, the Uniform Resource Locator for the video, the web address. So you have to provide that in order for people to view this. And they can't search for it. They'll never find it uh, without you giving them that URL, which is um, very complex and, and meaningless. So the, um, the uh, no one's going to guess. It. Private, you don't want to use for instructional videos. That's like your baby movies because it's way too restrictive. You have to specifically indicate who can see the video by providing their names and their email addresses. And they have to have Google accounts and they have to be logged into them in order to view the video. That's not practical with students. So unlisted is probably the most common choice, but public is great when you feel comfortable with it. And there's no student information being displayed. I do not recommend taking, for instance, your Zoom recordings from your Zoom classes with the sessions with your students and putting those on public because that violates FERPA. Unlisted would not because nobody but the people in your class will ever see it because they'll be the only ones you provide the URL to. And that URL will probably be behind a login wall on Canvas for that matter. So it's highly unlikely that anybody else would ever be able to see that video. So that's okay. So your Zoom recordings probably for the most part where students are appearing are gonna be unlisted. Uh, once you've made that decision, you just click save down here at the bottom and you're done.
videos on YouTube. If I close that window, it takes you to a list of all the videos you have on YouTube. I've got something north of 500 videos on YouTube right now. So my, you know, there's, it's a long list, but, and you may generate a, an amazing number because it's so simple to put your videos up on YouTube as you're seeing. There's that unknown video. To share that with someone, all I need is to go to the details page here for that video, which is this little pencil icon next to it. And there's the, you are, there's the link, the URL for it. You just email that to someone or put that link in a, in a web link in Canvas or um, embed this video in a Canvas page and your students can view it. So I think that answered, Elizabeth, your question on how do your students get to the video. Well, you probably put a link to it in Canvas so that they can click on that link and then view the video at YouTube. Thank you. Thank you for the question. That was so wonderfully timely. <laughs> um, uh, how do I find my recording? If I upload it to YouTube, how do I find it? Well, good question. Let me back up to the opening page of YouTube here. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I, that's a good question. Um, when you come into YouTube and you log in, if you click on your little um, avatar symbol up here, there is something called YouTube Studio in this list that you get when you click on this circle up here. YouTube Studio is your your channel management tool, your YouTube video management tool. And the second option uh, here in this list on the left is your video list. If you click on that, you can just scroll up and down to find your video and mouse over each one and the URL for the video will be in, on this details page. And it's different, of course, for each one. And there you can go back to the channel videos. So you have this video list in YouTube. Uh, if it gets, if your list gets so long that it's tedious to go through and find something individually, you can also search your channel, your video list uh, by keyword to find a particular video. Good question. Um, I would prefer, I'll tell you why I don't want to maximize my screen. Um, I'm avoiding this right hand edge of the screen here because for people on some devices, there are wind video windows and things like that over there that are, um, uh, can cover up what I'm talking about. Also in the recording of the video, there will be a, set of video windows here of you all and i don't want that to cover up anything that i'm talking about like up here in the upper right hand corner you however can uh expand what you're seeing when i share this screen by uh, going up to the top of your screen there'll be a little bar up there <coughs> with some attendee tools in it uh, that appear when I'm sharing my screen. And there's a little black button that says view options. And if you click on that, you've got some options, including fit to screen, that will make this bigger for you so that you can see it better. And unfortunately, I can't control that for you. All righty. Good questions. So that's kind of a, a primer on YouTube. And each of these tools that we're gonna to talk about today can very easily upload videos to YouTube. Some of them automatically, others a little more effort. But we've seen the process of uploading a video manually to YouTube already, and you see it's not 
not anything that anybody is really going to have any trouble with. So uh, we require this uh, in our online uh, online instruction training course. One of the activities in that course is to upload is to create a video and upload it to YouTube. We've just covered half of that. <laughs> now we're going to go and learn the creating part. Let me just get YouTube out of the way here for a second. And let's go back to our outline here and see where we are. All right. First tool, first screencasting tool that actually allows us to record screencasts that we're going to talk about is one called Screencast-O-Mac. There it is right there on the screen. And Screencast-O-Matic's uh, interesting in that it's a web, it's a cloud tool, a web-based tool. You don't have to install or at least manually install anything on your computer. You just go to a website and you run it from the, from your web browser. The URL for Screencast-O-Matic is right there, Screencast-O-Matic, www dot screencastomatic dot com. Let me put that in the chat tool to everyone, so you have that. That's about all you need to know to use Screencastomatic. I'm going to talk about it for a few minutes, but you can figure this out. Screencasting tools are so simple. Screencasting is by far the simplest multimedia production technique there is. It's something anybody can learn to do in 10 minutes, literally. It is also one of the most powerful and one of the most rapid tools. You can generate screencast after screencast after screencast in a very short period of time. So you can produce a volume of high quality instructional multimedia instruction uh, instructional material in very little time far more in a given length of time than you can with any other multimedia and production technique i know the tools are simpler to use they're quicker to use and they're cheaper than just about anything else so this is almost all, I mean, I do a lot of multimedia production and almost all of it is done by screencasting one, for, one way or another. All right, so let's go take a look at Screencast-O-Matic. I have that up here somewhere, there we go. Screencast-O-Matic.com, actually they've bought several URLs, so anything vaguely resembling that will work. You can see their default URL is screencast-o-matic.com. But just screencast-o-matic without the uh, dashes will work as well. Just about anything close to that they've bought <laughs> and will redirect to their site. So you go to screencast-o-matic.com and <laughs> there's the button, start recording for free. It doesn't get much simpler than that. So you click on that. And um, it is going to download a little thin client in the background, a little piece of software to your computer. And by the way, I, I speak of your computer, and indeed, you're almost always going to be producing screencasts on computers. But in fact, there's a version of Screencast-O-Matic that will run on your iPhone. And I think one for your Android phone as well. So you can record the screen on your portable device as well. That's kind of a niche um, application. It's something you might use to show someone how to do something on a smartphone or on an iPad. But it's um, much more common to do this on a computer. But the client will download in the background and it'll let you know when it's done. Obviously, I've already done that many, many moons ago on this computer. So I've got the computer already available, the uh, 
the client, the recorder client already available. And it says, uh, yeah, it's available. You can do this on a Chromebook, very inexpensive laptop running the Chrome operating system, or on a Mac or on Windows. And as I mentioned, the, there are also apps for iOS and Android smartphones as well, and tablets. But we're going to show the computer uh, uh, version of this. And it looks pretty much the same on a PC or a Mac, because it's being run through a web browser. So we just click launch free recorder. And it takes a second to load up. Oh, it is gonna make me redo this because it's probably been a while since I've downloaded this. So I'll uh, save that. Yeah, <laughs> yes I do. <laughs> I wanna replace it, it knows I've done this before, but that's a new version of it. Maybe they're new, nice new features I don't know about. Now I just start this by clicking on it, as it told me. And the recorder launched. It's updating it. This won't happen every time, but it will happen the first time for sure. And in a minute, my recorder is going to appear on the screen. There it is. Not a whole lot to look at. Look, uh, look at. It's a um, just a little window that pops up here in the lower left. Uh, we've got a record button down here, which is the thing we're most interested in. But let's talk about the other things we're seeing here as well. Um, Screencast-O-Matic, under some circumstances at least, will let you uh, record your computer screen, which is what we're talking about after all. It will also let you record your webcam, whatever your webcam is seeing, if you have a webcam and you want to do that. Or it can record both at the same time. So it'll record your screen, and then down in the lower right-hand corner, you'll have a little image of yourself as well that will be recorded. Let me clear that lower right-hand corner of the screen. Um, I will say that that those second two options, the webcam and the and both, are available only if you pay them. The free recorder will only record your screen, which is usually what you want to do anyway. So that's not much of a limitation. There is an important limitation on the free recorder, however. It will only allow you to record screencasts of up to 15 minutes in length. Um, that can be viewed in two ways, as a limitation or as encouragement to keep your videos short. Research shows that by the time your students are seven minutes into one of your screencasts, most of them are gone. <laughs> they gave up. Because unless your screencasts are a lot better than mine, they ain't going to be like watching Grey's Anatomy on Thursday night. They're not quite that riveting. So it's the best screencast is the one that's as short as possible and still allow you to get the point you're trying to make across. If you're doing a long, complex concept, it's better to break it into several screencasts if possible so that your students don't have to wait to lit to sit through an hour of screencast video. Trust me, I've made screencasts that were hours, two hours long, and I don't know if anybody ever watched them but me or not. <laughs> I kind of doubt it. Um, I try to avoid that. There are circumstances that might cause you to want to do that, though. So that 15-minute time limit can be a bit of a uh, hang-up sometimes. You can, however, uh, sign up with screen, uh, Screencast-O-Matic for a year and get unlimited recording time on your recorder and a bunch of other little perks. And the bloodsuckers want $20 for the year. <laughs> it's, it's not terribly expensive. So my, if you get into using Screencast-O-Matic, I almost guarantee you'll find it useful. Uh, useful enough to 
be worth 20 bucks for the year. And in another, in another year, the bloodsuckers will come back and ask for another 20. But I think you'll get more than your money's worth out of it. So uh, while Screencast-O-Matic is not entirely free, given this limitation, it is pretty darn cheap. So um, that's why this is saying max time right now. Um, I am, in fact, I have, in, in fact, have a, um, uh, a paid account that I could sign in with up here. But like I say, most of my screencasts are trying to keep well under 15 minutes anyway, so I don't even bother most of the time. And I'm also not, uh, while sometimes recording my webcam is is convenient, I have other tools for that, so I don't usually use that. And I've never been a big fan of a screencast where you're trying to get your students to focus on what you've recorded on the screen, and there's a little picture of you down here in the corner bouncing around and talking and, and uh, not really adding, in my case anyway, not really adding anything constructive to the screencast. You know, if I were Brad Pitt or something, it might be a little different. But, it, but that, if I were, that would be even more distracting. So I just don't see the value of having myself down here in the right corner um, uh, while, while it's going. It does produce a little bit more of a personal connection maybe but I, I just never figured it was worth it. So I'm, I'm not even gonna bother showing you that. It's, there's nothing to it except to just click this box here and your webcam will automatically uh, record you or whatever it's looking at uh, while you're recording the screencast. There are circumstances where that might be valuable, but not too many of them. So I'm warned that I can't go longer than 15 minutes. If you have paid the 20 bucks, this can go as long as your hard drive has space, which is probably a long time, way longer than you should. Then it asks you, what part of the screen do you want to record? And your options are, um, if you have the paid account, you can record like individual windows and not get everything on the screen or uh, any region of the screen that you choose. I've never been a fan of doing anything but recording full screen anyway, because when I'm recording something, I don't want to have to think, well, wait a minute. I said to record this part of the screen. Is what I'm talking about in that part of the screen? <laughs> Are people seeing what I think they're seeing? I don't want to have to worry about that when I'm in the middle of a recording. So I just record the entire computer screen, and I know they're going to see it. Uh, you also want to make sure that uh, Screencast-O-Matic is hearing you, that your microphone is working. Obviously, mine is working because of this little a meter that goes across the screen. I can uh, click here, and I can select microphones if I need to. That's the one I'm using right now. And uh, if I do that, um, the uh, I can just click auto adjust volume and Screencast-O-Matic will make sure that I'm not recording too hot, too sen that my microphone's not too sensitive. I don't want that to happen because if it is, the sound will be distorted. Also, of course, I don't want it so soft that it's hard for people to hear you and I have to turn their volume all the way up and they can barely hear me anyway. I don't want that. So if you select auto adjust volume, it will do that for you. Uh, you can even test it. I've tested this one. I'm not going to bother with that. So okay. So clearly the microphone that can it can hear me, and I've got the right mic a a functional microphone selected anyway. Uh, the other option vis-a-vis -vis sound here is whether I want YouTube or excuse me, uh, Screencast-O-Matic, to record the, com the audio that comes through my computer speakers. I might want to do that if I were, say, going to play a sound file during my screencast. Or if there were going to be maybe a piece of software I'm uh, demonstrating has audible cues to certain things going on. And I want to capture those. Or maybe I want to play a video 
and record it by screencast. Um, and I want to record the sound as well. I would need to turn that on. In the free version, you can't do that. And the need to do that is relatively less common than certainly less common than needing to record your primary microphone. But that is something you do get for your 20 bucks. Um, and that's really about all you have to worry about the screencast o matic uh, The, uh, you're, at this point, you're ready to record. Uh-oh. My, I just clicked on something and got rid of my record button. That's more like it. <laughs> all right. So I'm, it, once you set all of this stuff, you don't usually have to revisit it each time. So the screencast recorder comes up and you punch the big red button that says rec for record. A red button is a universal symbol in media production for record start recording. So all I have to do to uh, start this, to start my recording is click that red button. So now we need to decide what we're going to record. I had something in mind earlier, trying to remember what it was. <laughs> um, we want it to be something short, so it doesn't take too long here. Um, well, how about that PowerPoint we talked about? Let me bring up a PowerPoint presentation here. I can do all this while the recorder is sitting there patiently waiting because I want to have my screen ready to record before I hit that red button. And let's see, here's a little PowerPoint, uh, sample PowerPoint I use for demonstration sometimes. I stole off the internet at some point. Uh, so I just bring up my, to record a PowerPoint narration, I just bring up my PowerPoint presentation on the screen. I can go into slideshow mode if I want to, but usually this for just this edit mode where I have a big image of the sl of each slide and then slide navigation over here on the left so I can go back and forth readily. It usually works just fine, so I just leave it here. So now to record this narration, I just hit the record button and take a deep breath, <clears throat> clear my throat. Think about what I want to say. Maybe I have a script or some notes or an outline. Maybe I just wing it from the slides. Just depends on how I'm feeling that day. Actually, the better, the more preparation you do before you start recording, the better the screencast will be in the long run. An outline, at least, is a really good idea uh, of what you want to do during your screencast and you print that out on paper and you have it sitting next to you so you don't forget stuff. The uh, a, a script can be a good idea, though most of us, good Lord, we're all expert bloviators. We wouldn't be in this profession if we weren't. So <laughs> Most instructors don't have to write out a script. You just do what you do in class and it comes naturally. You lecture. And it's, it's hard to stop us from doing that. So uh, that's usually not really that critical for, a, for an instructor with the level of experience I see in this group here. So <laughs> uh, the, uh, that's not probably an issue. And with this PowerPoint presentation, of course, the slides are my talking points, so I don't have, I don't need notes beyond that in most cases. It's what they're there for, after all. So I get ready, take a deep breath, and press record. It counts me down. Five tips for listening well by Mortimer Snurd, my spirit animal. Next slide. When you're in a situation where you need to listen, you'll be a much more effective listener if you're prepared, if you're mentally and physically ready. If maybe you've read a little bit 
before you uh, about the topic before you go in to at least familiarize yourself with some terminology and things like that. You're less likely to show up and find yourself just lost after five minutes and zoned out thinking about what you're going to have for dinner that night. Another good idea is to be quiet because you're a much better listener when you're not adding to the conversation. It doesn't mean you can't speak up when you have something to say, but you should be quiet a lot more than you're speaking unless you're the presenter. And when you do say, uh, say something, you'll be much more likely to be listened to. And I have no idea, I, and I've never had a good aura, so I, don't, I can't speak to that. I think you probably saw that down the lower left-hand corner, my, when I hit record, my record button turned into a little pause symbol, which is two thick vertical lines parallel to one another inside a circle. That's a universal pause symbol for a VCR or, a, or any kind of media tool. And you can always, in the mid, uh, on all of these tools, you can always pause in the middle of the screencast recording and catch your breath, think a little bit about what you want to do. And your audience will never know you did that. There, there won't be a pop or jump or anything in the final screencast. So you don't have to do everything in one long take, which makes it much, it makes the recording process much, much, much easier. Speaking of the recording process, there is one thing that I always try to talk about with screencasting, a couple of things actually. Um, one is you got to get over the sound of your own voice when it's recorded. Because we don't sound to others as we sound to ourselves. Because we're getting, the, by the time our voice gets to our ears, it's also being influenced by the resonance inside our uh, oral cavity and uh, and uh, the bone conduction to uh, to our middle ear and things like that. So we just don't sound to others like we sound to ourselves. And to hear yourself recorded, played back, is kind of a almost a personal violation in some cases. It, it eliminates a lot of illusions about how we think we sound. And I know people who just won't do this because they hate the sound of their own voice when it's recorded. And I urge you not to worry about that, <laughs> please. Don't let that stop you. Uh, you can get over it after a while. I've, I've listened to my own voice way too many times and, and, and had all my illusions burst. And um, I've just gotten used to it. It takes a certain desensitization, but it's worth it in the long run. Also, don't worry if the screencast is not perfect because it never will be, no matter how hard you try. And if you try hard, too hard to make it perfect, it will be an excruciating experience. And it still won't be perfect. And you'll waste a tremendous amount of time and your students won't care. I hate to tell you this, but when you get up in front of a class and lecture, you're probably not perfect then either. I know damn well I'm not. And, uh, you know, it, it is a little, again, damaging to the ego to have that recorded and to have to watch yourself not be perfect in, in a screencast. But just you just have to get over it. Perfect, a very wise man once told me, is the enemy of good. And that's especially true in screencasting. There's no re reason to try to run through your screencast four times, your recording four times to get it as perfect as you can manage. Just let it rip. And as long as you don't do something that makes it difficult for the student to understand what you're, the point you're trying to get across, don't worry about it. Accept it, save it, put it on YouTube and move on to the next one and spend the time making another screencast that won't be perfect either, but will still be exceptionally instructionally valuable to your students. All right, I'll get off the soapbox now and go back and start 
my recording again by just pressing the record button again. That counts me down. Pay attention when you're listening. Focus on what people are saying. Don't be formulating the answer in your mind before the speaker does. You're just gonna go off on a tangent and try not to be defensive. And once you've done all that, you'll definitely uh, have had a better listening experience. And this slide shows that you, uh, you don't have to be a computer genius to make a screencast or to use PowerPoint. And I pause again. Nothing to it. You, you've probably given that PowerPoint lecture a hundred times. Indeed, you may be asking yourself every day, how many times am I going to have to give this PowerPoint lecture before I die? And the answer can be with screencasting, one more time. <laughs> you, you got it in the can from now on. You can just play movies in class. Maybe you don't want to do that, but you could. If nothing else, you can refer students who didn't come to class to the to the PowerPoint lecture online and it will be so much value more valuable to them than the um, just the slide deck would be so okay we're we're done here and look son of a gun there's a button there that says done in relation to what I just said about perfection, there's also a button that says, I, this is so fouled up beyond all recognition, I just wanna throw it away and start all over again. Well, you can do that too, but I really encourage you not to use that button unless it's just an extreme circumstance where things went so far off the rails that there was no recovery. We're done. I'm gonna click done. Let's see what happens there. Well, I'm given a couple of options. If I have paid my 20 bucks, I have the option to do a little basic video editing. And uh, this introductory uh, presentation here doesn't really allow time for that, but you do have some editing capability if you pay the 20 bucks to Screencast-O-Matic. You can do things like, uh, as we were talking about earlier, Damo, uh, you could take your, um, uh, a recording and chop the beginning and the end of it off. Trimming, it's called, so that uh, the little bit at the beginning that you don't need and the little bit at the end where you finished and you're just cleaning things up don't have to be made visible to your students and other more complicated things. Uh, the editor in Screencast-O-Matic is rel fairly rudimentary and not one I would really recommend if you're going to be doing a lot of video editing, but it can, it does have some capability. But the vast majority of the time, what you're going to want to do is just save and upload the video. So you click on that. And here we are. First thing you can do is preview your recording and see if it looks and sounds okay. Five tips for listening well by Mortimer Snurd, my spirit animal. Next slide. When you're in a situation where you need to listen, you'll be a much more effective. So that looks and sounds fine. Again, no, uh, no mellifluous uh, sonority to my voice or anything, but you can tell what I'm saying. That's all that really matters. And that's not Screencast-O-Matic's fault. <laughs> So I've ascertained that it's probably okay. Screencast-O-Matic does have some captioning capability built into it, but it's nowhere near as good as the cap capability in say YouTube. So I'm just not gonna worry about that because I'm gonna upload my screencast to YouTube. I could save it as a video file on my local hard drive, or I could upload it to Screencast-O-Matic's servers. But quite frankly, Screencast-O-Matic's playback's not as good as YouTube's. So YouTube is free. 
Screencast-O-Matic servers, in fact, are not. You, you have to pay the 20 bucks to get access to them, and you're limited to how much video you can upload, and you have to pay more if you want to upload more. Not so with YouTube, and YouTube just works better. So I'm going to upload to YouTube. Click on that option. And in my case, I'm already logged in to YouTube on this computer. So Screencast-O-Matic says, oh, I know who you are. Google knows who you are. We're ready to go. If you are not logged in to your Google account or you slash YouTube account, when you made your recording, you'd be prompted to log in at this point. And then you'd get to the screen. No big deal. Uh, just some basic uh, account information. You can add tags. You can set your privacy level here, but you can do that when you get it into YouTube as well as we saw. So there's really nothing you have to do here once you've logged into YouTube, except just click publish. Screencast-O-Matic now does the upload for you. Indeed, it does most of what I showed you how to do manual when I uploaded the video manually to YouTube, it does it for you. So it, you just see the little blue bar go across the screen. Obviously, the faster your internet connection and the smaller the video, the faster this will happen. But it won't take too long in any case, in most cases. Um, do I have questions right now? While we're watching that go across the screen, let me look here. Uh, where in Canvas can students find the URL to the video? Well, that depends on where you put it. Um, you can, let me bring Canvas up here on the screen real quick, because that's a very good question. Because if your students can't find it, it's not going to do them much good. Um, you can put your video into Canvas in a number of ways. You can make a, um, you can put it in a module, in your modules tool, by adding a, an external URL, a web link to your video. Uh, the URL that you need to enter is the YouTube share URL. Let me pick up that one that I made, that I, we uploaded earlier. We'll have one from Screencast-O-Matic in a minute. Indeed, let's go back and take a look at that and see how Screencast-O-Matic's doing, see if it's finished yet. Okay, there he is. Uh-oh. I have aggravated Screencast-O-Matic by navigating away from it. It's still working in the background, but I don't want to. I don't want to mess. I don't want to poke at it <laughs> yet. Though I'm fairly sure it's uploaded that video. Uh, so let me uh, go ahead. And just go back to YouTube for a second. I forgot about that. That does sometimes get irritated when they, you navigate away from it. Um, and uh, here's that one I just put up there. I can go to the details page. I can copy the URL for that video, the uh, web address for that video to the clipboard. Now I can go back to Canvas and I can paste that into this box here on the external URL ad and give it a name. Um, that was unknown video. <laughs> Hopefully your name is a little bit more informative than that. It's generally a good idea to load videos in a new tab when you're using, making an external URL link. And you add the item to the uh, module. Now your student, and once I publish that, your student can just come along and click on that link and play the video. They have to open it, okay the opening of a new window, and there's that unknown video. All righty, just doing a little test recording to the cloud here. Okay, I've got the volume turned down on that. I just want to see that this is working. Check, check, check. Yeah, I just 
messing around there. So that's all there is to putting a video that's loaded onto YouTube, putting a link to it into Canvas. You can get a little fancier than that. If you want to make a Canvas page, new page, we'll just call it video page, edit. Now I can open up that page, which is blank, because I just created it, and edit it. And I can go to the Insert Edit Media tool in the Canvas Rich Content Editor and just paste that URL in the source box here. And I get what's called a, a video embed, which looks a lot sexier. It's still basically just a link. The video is still on YouTube. And can't, it's not counting against your file space in your Canvas course. But your, and your students can play it from right here. All righty, just doing a little test. So that's how your students can find the link to your video. You put it, you put the link into Canvas in one of those ways. There are a couple other options uh, so that you can, uh, they can find it and play it. How do we get the embed code and use it? To, uh, yeah, that's one of, one of the other ways to do it. Let's go look and see if our uh, Screencast-O-Matic video is up on YouTube now. I can go to my YouTube studio, and since I lo was logged into my account, uh, it should be in my videos list by now. Yep, there it is. Uh, it got named recording number 11. <laughs> I could have changed that before I uploaded it. I can change that now. Uh, and that was uh, five tips for listening well. A masterpiece of not of PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and a little advertising for screencast o -Matic. I'll leave that there. Now um, I can, to get the so-called embed code for this video, for those of you who want a little bit more uh, control over what your video looks like in your Canvas page, you can go to the actual video page on uh, YouTube and click share and uh, click on the embed option in the share box and copy this code, this HTML code, into onto your clipboard just by clicking this copy button down here. You don't have to worry anything about how that, what that code looks like or what, what it means, unless you're interested. It, it's unnecessary to worry about it. So now I go back to Canvas. If I edit this page, I can put my Screencast-O-Matic video I just made onto this same page, or I can make a new page if I wanted to. Um, by the same thing, insert edit media. But instead of using the general tab, I can use the so-called embed tab. And I can paste that embed code that I just copied from YouTube into this box and click OK. All I got to do. There's that video. This one you have a little bit of, a little bit more control over than you do the other. But there it is. Five Tips for Listening Well by Mortimer Snurd. My spirit students can full screen it. Dave, is there any chance you could retrace the, the final step about going to your video and then how you got to the embed? You could oh, how I got to the embed? Yeah, please. In, in Canvas or in YouTube? No, just, just the t YouTube. You, you, you went to your video and then- How did the, I find? Yeah. yeah, I went to my video. Okay. Here we are. Let me clear this. I went to the actual display page for the video. Okay. Okay. And I clicked on the share button down here in the lower yeah. right, just below the video. It's always there. Even if it's okay. not your video, you can share it with someone else. Okay. You click on share, and then you click on the embed, embed option. Okay. And then you copy this to your clipboard. 
Thank you so much. You bet. So that's how you put it into Canvas. And that's how we just created a screencast in Screencast-O-Matic by just following our nose through the, through the interface, the Screencast-O-Matic interface. Like I say, it takes 10 minutes to learn and less than that to accomplish. Uh, the, the, most of that time was me talking about it. I could have had this video up online in, in seven or eight minutes. And that, and that was a, you know, a five slide PowerPoint presentation. The, by far the hardest part to screencasting is deciding what you want to show your students and what you want to say about it. The planning, the nuts and bolts of making the screencast are almost trivially simple. So anybody can screencast and anybody can do a lot of screencasting if they find it valuable without spending much money. Maybe that 20 bucks, which you didn't have to spend that if you, if you keep your, your screencast under 15 minutes, which is a good idea, you don't have to spend the 20 bucks for Screencast-O-Matic. Okay, that's one tool. It's maybe the most, it's one of the more common tools used for screencasting, particularly by uh, people who are just getting started because it's very inexpensive, potentially free, and very easy to use. There is another tool that I really like that I'm going to show you. The process uh, is not going to be fundamentally. Yes, they, please. I, I have a question. a question. So you have a page, you created uh, uh, everything that you need for this page. How, how are you going to connect this page with your module? I'm sorry, now I lost the last bit of how, that. How can we connect? that particular page with the module? Oh, it's already connected with the module because I made it from within the module. Okay, can you show module. it, please? Can you show it? Uh -huh. Yeah, we're going back to the modules here. I'm just looking okay. for the modules link. It's, it's in a different place in every one of my courses. Uh, oops, I didn't save that. Let me save that. Canvas is looking after me. Now, if I go to the modules tool, there's that, the link to that page. I put it in the first module because I created the page from within the module rather than can using you, the pages can you, tool. Yeah, can you repeat again? How did you create the, the page in, within exactly. the module? Exactly, what I did was I went to the, I picked the module I wanted to put this in. Then I okay. went to the plus sign, the add tool for that module, clicked on that. Can you show it? Uh -huh. Okay. Oops, I, I I just realized I was probably behind that. Let me move it back over here. There we go. That it may have been behind something for you. Uh, here's the plus yeah. sign for the module right there. Uh, okay. The add okay. tool uh -huh. for the module. You click on uh -huh. that, and you select pay. I selected page because that's what I wanted to add. And then I said new page because I wanted to create a brand new page rather than use one I already had. And all I had to do was give the page a name to create it. Mm -hmm. Video page two. <laughs> and then I clicked the add item. And that creates a blank page which is already linked into the module. So I don't have to worry about um, putting that page and putting a link to that page in the module, it's already there. What I do have to worry about, of course, is adding content to the page. So I just click on the name of the page and click edit to add content to it, like a video or text or a picture or whatever. So that's how I get that linked into the module, the way I like to do it, because here I'm creating a page and linking it in the module in the same operation. So I don't have two tasks, I just have one. So you go to the module, okay, you create a page, and then right. you go back to page and actually uh, upload it with the, your video, yes? Right, right, you edit the page and you add your video, you embed your video, or just link your video if you prefer 
to it. And the students can then open up the page by clicking on the link in the module and then just click on the embed link for the video and play the video. Is it the same uh, with the assignments? Very similar, yes. Very similar. Can you show, please, quickly? Unfortunately, I, that's a little bit outside the scope of this, and we're running, we've only got a little over a half hour left, so I'm probably okay. going to have to, I'll be happy to do that in the question and answer period at the end. Okay, okay, thank you so much. All righty. I understand. You bet. All righty. Uh, so, another screencasting tool, which operates a little differently, um, is called Snagit. And um, uh, S N A G I T. It started off life as the best screenshot tool. Uh, the tool allows you to take a picture of a portion, all or a portion of your screen, and turn it into a an image file that you can then insert into a Word document or a web page or something like that. But a static image, just a picture. But about six or seven years ago, TechSmith, the company that makes Snagit, added screencasting capability to Snagit. And screen, uh, Snagit has an excellent screencasting recorder that I use almost exclusively for my recording my screencasts because the workflow for Snagit is so streamlined and so quick. It allows me to create a screencast recording faster than any other way I know. And I, there are days when I might make six, seven, eight or more screencasts, when I'm answering questions for faculty or creating tutorials to put on our tutorial site or whatever, I can be doing a lot of screencasting in one day. I don't want, I want the process to be as streamlined and as quick as possible. So I use Snagit. Also the Snagit recorder, produces as high a quality a screencast recording as you can get. At least as good as the one the recorder in Screencast-O-Matic. And, um, and again, it's, the process is more streamlined. Because when you install Snagit onto your computer, it runs in the background all the time. It's sitting there waiting for you to make a screencast all the time. Whereas with Screencast-O-Matic, I have to start a web browser and I have to navigate to Screencast-O-Matic, I have to launch the recorder and so on. All of that takes several seconds. Doesn't sound like that big a deal, but if you're making one screencast after another, the savings adds up. And Snagit's been sitting here waiting for us this whole time. You've been seeing it, but you probably haven't noticed it. It's this little blue bar. You may not even be able to see it, depending on how you have your screen configured. But there's a little blue bar here, right in the upper right-hand corner of my screen, right there, which if I tickle it with the mouse, expands into a big record button. That's Snagit. That's what Snagit looks like in operation. It's always there, waiting for me to make a screencast. So all I have to do to start a screencast is click the big red button. Uh, like Screencast-O-Matic, uh, Snagit will allow us to um, uh, decide what part of the screen we want to record. So I could record just this window, or I could draw a rectangle on the screen and record just that part then I can always adjust that later too. I want to get the whole screen. Again, I like to record the entire screen when I'm recording a screencast because I never know exactly where stuff is going to end up or what I may want to show. Once I select the part of the screen I want to um, uh, record, I get a little control bar like this popping up. That popped up on another monitor. I've got three monitors on this computer. So normally it would just pop up right in front of you. And uh, this is Snagit's way of asking you what you want to do. This 
a little camera icon would let me capture a screenshot, a still image of my screen. And then Snagit has all sorts of editing tools you can use to mark, to um, uh, annotate that screenshot. And that's what it was originally designed for. But this little icon, the little stylized camera, will allow me to record a video, as, it, as the tooltip says. So I click on that. And it goes through an initialization process. And now I'm ready to record. I've got a little scrolling dotted line going around what I'm gonna record. So it kind of reminds me, in this case, the full screen, that I'm gonna be recording the full screen. But if I bring my little uh, control bar back over here again, it's uh, showing me that uh, I'm, it's hearing me, and I can switch microphones if I need to, if I have more than one, or if it's accidentally listening to something that's not there. I can also decide whether to record the system audio, the, what comes through the computer speakers, or not. I can turn that on and off at this point by just clicking on it. And um, it also will allow me to record to my, record my webcam should I want to. I don't want to in this case. I've talked about that. So I'm going to make a screencast, not a webcam recording, talking head. Uh, clearly it's hearing me just fine. We've got enough deflection on the meter there. It's going to be fine. So all I have to do to start recording is click this record button. I probably, well, the other thing I have to do is decide what I want to record. <laughs> I sort of didn't prepare, but let's see. Um, no problem. Um, let's say I want to show you how to make a, uh, oh, wait a minute. What was the, the question we, we have pending uh, about Canvas? that I just said we'd have to wait on. How, how to make an assignment. I think that's what the question was. How to make an assignment. Okay. Let's say we wanted to show someone how to make an assignment in Canvas. It's an ideal application for a, uh, a screencast. I'm going to have to do a little juking around here once I start the recording, or I could at this point, since I forgot, I, I hadn't made up my mind what I was going to record before I started this process, which is, by the way, a really bad idea. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. So I'm, I can just stop the process at this point by clicking on this big X here. Excuse me. And, oh, yes. How, how did you get that bar, the one that you just eliminated? We, we can't I, see. Yeah, we I, can't. I tickled my little can or my little snagit. Uh, we can see it on the screen. Here. Dave, can you move your screen so we can we can see it? I uh, know, but you can. What? You can move. You can move that video of me out of the way. So well, it's it, okay. It, it, it is my. Uh, uh, you're you're seeing my cursor vanish behind an image of me talking. Well, not not really. Let me know. see. Let me see if that if Zoom is sharing that. Come to think of it, I should check Maybe that. I can it see be. it. You can see it. Yes, yes Trevor. Oh, we can oh, see good. it. Good. Okay, thank you. I can see so it. It's right here in the upper right hand corner. I just move my mouse cursor over that little blue bar right there, which you may have trouble seeing, and the. I think we see a portion of it. Yeah, we the, see a small portion of it, which is fine. So you click me, on that to get to the bar, the control. Let bar. me move it a little. Let me move it a little further to the left here. You can always move that around. Can you see it now? No, the same thing. The same. Okay. Uh, click view uh, uh, at the top of the screen. You should have a little bar that says, or a little button that says view options. Why don't okay. you click that yeah. and see if you can click fit to screen. And you should see things a little bit better. Uh, 
Okay. It says so, fit to window. I'm sorry? I said it says fit to window. Fit to window, right, sorry. <laughs> that should make it a little better a little bigger and you can make that window of yours bigger by full screening it uh click on the the square box in the upper right hand corner of the window if you're on a pc on a mac the the uh it's the tool uh, full screen tools on the upper left and um make your window as big as the window in which you're seeing my screen share as big as possible and that will make it easier to see as well so I, I I gather most of you are seeing this little box drop down with the big red button in it. Yes. And I click on that red button and then uh, I pick, if I'm going to record the full screen, I can just click where it says full screen here. And now that bar pops up. It popped up on another monitor for me, so I had to drag it over. And you're seeing that, I, yeah, you're seeing that bar you asked about it. So let me cancel out of that for a second and get ready to do the recording here on um, uh, Canvas. Now we're gonna record a tutorial on how to uh, create an assignment in Canvas. I'll do that by starting my Snagit recording, as we've just done a couple of times. I'm going to actually, in this case, I probably just want this window. So I'll just select that. And then I'll bring my bar over here so you can see it. I'll click the record a video, the little camera option. And now my bar changes looks like this and I've got a, an actual active record button and I can see that can that uh, Snagit is hearing me. So I click the record button. It counts me down. Just move that out of the way. Making an assignment in Canvas. Probably the best way to do that is to go to the modules tool. Pick the module into which you want to put the assignment. Click the Add Item button for that module. And from the Add menu, select Assignment. This is a new assignment, so I'll click on the words New Assignment. And I'll be asked to give the assignment a name. We'll just call this Assignment one. And then I'll click add item to make the blank assignment. But there's nothing there yet. I've just made an empty assignment. To edit, to rectify that, to edit the assignment, I click on the name of the assignment. And then click the edit button in the upper right corner of the screen, which allows me to enter, among other things, the instructions for the assignment. Remember that one? Yeah. <laughs> First assignment. <laughs> Tell me what you did on your summer vacation in the instructions. Now, I also need to give a number of points for that assignment. I need to tell Canvas how I expect students to turn this in, which un under our circumstances right now will be online. On paper is not an option. And we're not using an external tool like my whatever lab, the publisher. And I do want a submission, so it's gonna be an online submission. And I would really like them to type this out in a Word document and upload it to me as part of the, and the assignment will provide them with a Dropbox where they can upload the file. So I'm gonna say file upload. Maybe I'll restrict file types to document DOC and DOCX. 
because I want a Word document. And anybody should be able to produce a Word document from any Word processor they're using, even free ones. Uh, I probably don't need it check for plagiarism, but I do have that option. And I can set due dates. and availability dates if I wish, or I can just leave it available all the time. And I can save, well, when I'm ready, I can save. And that's really all I have to do on an assignment, is give in, name it, give, it in, give some instructions, set a point value, decide how the assignment's gonna be submitted, set a due date, and maybe availability dates, and then just save and publish. Or just save and publish later if you prefer. Since I started this process from the module, that assignment is in the module, published, and all ready to go. When I'm done, there are a couple of different ways to stop it, but I can just click on my stop button here, the blue big square, that's a standard stop symbol on a VCR or other playback devices. And just that fast, the video is ready to go. He said. That's interesting. Can move that out of the way. You're not impressing it. Ah, there, finally it came up. <laughs> Snagit was being a little slow. There's a lot going on on this computer right now. That would not normally happen. Normally the video would have been visible right away. This Snagit editor automatically pops up. It popped up on another screen for me because, I, because of the multiple monitors. But normally, as soon as you hit the stop button on the Snagit control bar, the Snagit editor pops up and it shows you a preview of your video, just like Screencast-O-Matic did. Just move that out of the way. Making an assignment in Canvas. Okay, so everything recorded fine. You can see everything just fine. You can hear me. But that first little bit, I really didn't want in there probably. So I can take my little cursor, playback cursor here in Snagit, and I can click on the little red uh, square there on the corner of it. And I can pull it over until the, just until that bar vanishes. And I can cut that out. That's called trimming the beginning of the video out of the way. Making an assignment. I needed to trim just a little more because I didn't get all the audio out. That's, uh, that's no trouble. Making an assignment in Canvas. Okay, that's fine. Now, if I go out here to the far, I can scrub. That's called scrubbing through the video. I just grab the play, playback cursor and move it over. You don't have to do what I'm doing here. I'm just showing you how to trim the video because I had a question about it earlier. Go to where the video finishes, all ready to go. And that was it. That was the last thing I said. So now I can trim all this other stuff where I brought the, talked about the control bar and so on, brought that over. I can take that out. You can do this in Screencast-O-Matic as well and cut it out. So now I have a video that's all ready to go document and anybody should be able to produce a and that process is so streamlined from starting the screencast to having it up here on the screen just takes seconds for each video and now I can share this video let me get that a little bit out of the way there I can share this video by clicking on this share button in the upper right hand corner, and I can share it with YouTube. <laughs>
I can put it in my YouTube account just that fast. Click on you, the YouTube option. Uh, it's saving the capture. The Normally, this happens so fast you don't even see it, but because I've got Zoom running and recording at the same time, things are running a little slower for Snagit. Normally, you wouldn't even see this little green bar going across it. It happened so fast you didn't uh, you wouldn't have any idea that this was going on in the background. And now uh, I'm asked to give it a name for you a title for YouTube. Creating a I might even use this one. Create except I, I have done this tutorial before, but this this will make the point. Creating Sorry, a canvas assignment. go back just yeah. a little bit. That share button is in uh, Canvas or the one that you just used? No, that, that's in the Snagit yeah. editor. Thank you. That's in the Snagit editor. And I selected YouTube to, to share. Yeah, it's a little hard to tell which window is which here. Right here. Oh, now it's got to save again. Sorry. <laughs> again, usually this is instantaneous. And then we're going to give it the... Uh, we're going to give it a name, and that's probably all we have to do. Snagit uses a fair bit of the computer's capability at any given time, so everything gets a little slower when you're running Snagit and Zoom at the same time. Um, so, uh, creating a Canvas assignment. I could add a description and some keywords if I wanted to. I can also do that later. And um, I'll probably this one, I don't mind this one being public. So I'll just click upload. You can see the progress of the upload up here in the upper right hand corner. Again, this would normally be a little faster, but uh, we're using quite a bit of bandwidth on Zoom right now. It's really quite remarkable that you can use Zoom to show other multimedia applications in operation. I couldn't believe this the first time I tried, that it worked first time I tried this, yay, these many years ago. Zoom is truly an amazing tool. Okay, and it's up on YouTube. If I want to look at it, I get a little box down here in the lower left-hand corner. I, well, it just got away from me, oh well. Um, it put, though, also the share URL for the video on my clipboard automatically. I didn't even have to ask it to do that. So I can get this Snagit editor out of the way. I'm done with Snagit for the moment. I can go to my module in Canvas. I can make a new page. Let's call this one uh, Snagit video. Add the item. Click the same process again. Click on the name of the empty page, edit it, and just go to insert edit video, paste what's on my clipboard. That's the YouTube URL for that video already. I don't even have to go to YouTube to do this. Click OK, and bang, there it is. And that's the video we just created. Just Dave, that fast. Making an assignment in can absolutely. Okay, uh, in order to get Snagit editor, do I need to make a, uh, do I need to create an account with Snagit or is it? No, no Snagit, that's a good question. How would you get Snagit? Snagit is a piece of software you have to install on your local computer. Okay. You can get it from techsmith.com mm -hmm. is the name of the company. T-E-C-H-S-M-I-T-H, -E as you see right here. Just press enter. And uh, you can go to, let me just look at products here, and go to Snagit. For you, <laughs> you want to go to the pricing tool here because, and you see that Snagit is not a lot of money, but there's no need for you to pay that much. If you go to the education tab here, your price for Snagit is $29.95. It's 10 bucks more than you pay for a year's worth of use of Screencast-O-Matic. 
but this is a permanent license. It's not a subscription. So you can use Snagit for years. I, I, I've used, I usually update my Snagit every time I, a new version, a new major version comes out just because I like the software, but I could quite frankly still be using the version of Snagit I bought five years ago and it would still be run, doing everything I need to do just fine. So you can use this for years without Dave, ever having to be, pay anything more. Mm -hmm. Dave, would it be updated for however many years, you, if you're in five it years, will, it will they automatically do, update? Are, they do what they call maintenance updates for free. Okay, they'll, if there's a, you know, if a problem, a bug shows up or something like that, they'll fix it and they'll send you a message and say, we've just created a new free update for Snagit and here you can install it. Every okay, year, you. every year to two years though, they make, a, a, they do a major update. And that one you would have to pay for. Usually it's half the price, 15 bucks to update it. But you don't have to do the update. It'll keep working just fine. If there are any major bugs or anything that are preventing you from using, that might prevent you from using it in certain ways, they'll fix that for free. But if there, if you, if you want some new sexy features and so on, major new sexy features and so on, you, you have to pay the 15 bucks. But seriously, I've got versions of Snagit going back 10 years, and I could use the first one I ever bought about as effectively as I'm using this one. I just like to have the latest version, but that's, that's emotional, not a need, a want, not a need. So um, the, uh, you could use the same version of Snagit for years and years and years and never have to update it. So you recommend this, you recommend Pardon? this, you recommend this, uh, uh, it's better than screen screenomatic, screencast? My, my recommendation would be for you to try them both and see which one you like. Yes, this is the one I like. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be best for you. And there is, if you look up here at the top of the screen, a free trial. I think it works for like 15 days. And you can try it out and see if you like it. And if you don't, if you do, at the end of 15 days, you can pay for it. If you don't, you can just uninstall it from your computer and use Screencast-O-Matic. To snag it, I, I like for two reasons. One is the very efficient workflow. It's quicker, a little bit quicker than Screencast-O-Matic. And if you make enough screencasts, that adds up and save time, significant save time over the months. The other thing I like is that it integrates very well with another TechSmith product that I'm going to show you just, just briefly in a, in a minute here. So I would say that would be something you'd have to decide, and you can try them both for free. Question before, you before you do that, Dave. Yes. Mm -hmm. The trimming, fu trimming function, is it something that you do at the beginning and at the end, or are you, can you edit out you know, um, all kinds of blemishes in the, in the middle of your content? Uh, with Snagit, you cannot edit something out of the middle. Okay. You would have to have a different video editor, and that is something you could do with the Screencast-O-Matic editor. Okay. So that might be a determining factor. That's not a factor for me because I have a better editor if I need to do something uh, like that, but that might be a deciding factor for you in deciding between Screencast-O-Matic and Snagit. As I say, try them both. See which one you like, which one fits your needs best. They're both great products. I mean, I, I don't have nothing bad to say about either one of them. And they both give you this incredible power that we were talking about earlier. Okay, now, I've, now I'm sorry, I've got a... a uh, in order to finish uh, getting anything like finishing by three o'clock, I'm going to need to go ahead and do that. And then I'll answer your questions. I will not leave until I have answered everybody's question. I promise. Okay. So snag it. I'll just mention that there is another 
um, screencasting tool that I really like that is to you completely free and we've been using it this whole time and that's zoom zoom is a screencasting tool as well in addition to being a live meeting tool i've been making a screencast this whole time every time you or i hold a zoom meeting we and we record it and we share our screens to our students we're making a screencast. We're recording our screens. I'm doing that right now. There's my Snagit editor again, I can show you. This is all being recorded by Zoom. And when I finish with my Zoom session, uh, indeed, when I started my Zoom recording, I was able to, um, uh, I, selected the option to record to my local computer. So when I finish this Zoom meeting, my Zoom recording is going to be saved to my local computer to a folder called Zoom on my in my default document directory, the uh, default document folder on Windows or on the Mac. And much of that recording will be a screencast of me showing my screens to you and Zoom recording it. And Zoom records, and excellent, uh, since I'm not really sharing anything right now, let me stop the share a second so I can see you. Go back to gallery view maybe, yeah. Oh, wow, good heavens. There's a lot of people still here. I can usually run a lot more than that away by this time. Y'all are tough. <laughs> okay. Um, the um, Whenever I'm sharing my screen in Zoom, I'm making a screencast. And I can take that video file that Zoom sends to my local hard drive, and I can then upload that to YouTube, which is what I do with them anyway. And that's screencasting. So you don't need screencast o -matic or Snagit necessarily to do screencasts because all of you have free confer Zoom accounts, I'm presuming by now, though you can you can do screencasting with a free Zoom account. You, know, you don't even have to have the pro account from confer Zoom to do it. You just have to be able to share or to uh, um, record to your local computer. Indeed, if you record to the Zoom cloud, which is the default in the confer Zoom accounts. You can go to the Zoom cloud and you can download those video files and put them up on YouTube if you want to. Or you can just link the, the recordings on the Zoom cloud to your students in Canvas. Same thing, there's nothing magic about YouTube uh, in terms of uh, providing access to screencasts. The Zoom cloud works just fine if you're recording from Zoom. So Zoom, in addition to being a meeting tool, is a screencasting tool. And we've been doing that all along. Indeed, we were making multiple screencasts at the same time while running the Zoom recording. That, that's, Zoom is just such a remarkable uh, me, uh, 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 video conferencing tool. But it's also a screencasting tool. Indeed, you could, if you want your screencast to be nice and clean and not have students <laughs> in there with you, you can start a Zoom meeting with nobody else in it and share your screen and then start the recording. And, um, and just do a screencast with nobody else present in the meeting. So Zoom's every, really, the quality of the recordings in Snagit and Screencast-O-Matic are a little better than the ones in Zoom. But I doubt by looking at uh, that the untrained eye would be able to look at them and see any difference. Zoom's recording quality has gotten so good on the shared screens that there's really not much difference. The audio quality is a bit better, is noticeably better in Snagit and in Screencast-O-Matic. 
but usually the audio quality in a Zoom recording is perfectly acceptable. I will say, however, that generally the audio quality, in terms of the experience for the student, the audio quality is generally better, or is generally more important than the video quality. People will put up with bad video. They won't put up with bad sound. They just won't listen. Okay, two more minutes, if I may, if you'll indulge me. Uh, there's one more thing I want to show you very quickly because we don't have time. It's really a lead in to tomorrow's presentation. And that is the one screencasting tool that I haven't mentioned yet. Let me share my screen. And that is called Camtasia, a made up word. I have no idea where they came up with it. Cam obviously refers to camera in some way, but I don't know where Tasia came from. <laughs> And I, I, mean, I know Fantasia. Huh? it comes huh? from Disney, Disney, Fantasia. Fantasia. I've heard that theory, but I've asked people who work for the company and they won't say. <laughs> I don't think anybody knows anymore, to tell you the truth. Um, it, um, I know a number of people who work there. I've worked with them. I've presented with them at conferences and so on over the years. And they're, it's a wonderful company, TechSmith it is. But, Camtasia is a oh, something wrong. oh come on you're really gonna make me do that that's Windows 10 that is not Camtasia doing that ah Bill Gates fault no I don't want to worry about that um, Camtasia is the creme de la creme, the Cadillac, as we used to say, or maybe the Lexus now, of uh, screencasting tools. It's been around since the late 90s. I've worked with every version of it that's ever been out. But the recorder, the, the part of the screencasting that we've been doing today with Screencast-O-Matic and um, Snagit and Zoom, the recording part is not really not that much better in Camtasia than it is in any of the others. So I, I always record my screencasts and snag it. If I start a new project here, the thing that makes Camtasia specialty special is this editor here. Camtasia is a full-fledged video editor. I mean, you can cut together the evening news on this. It's, it's that good. It's a semi-professional video editor. Yet, it's very, e relative to other video editors, it's very easy to learn to use. One of the things I can do with a Snagit recording, and this is the, uh, the other reason I like Snagit so much, is I can share a Snagit recording directly to Camtasia. I don't know. Snagit is Snagit is a little bit in a snip because Zoom is running. <laughs> Again, usually this doesn't take any time at all. Da, 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 da. Come on, come on. Finish, finish. Green bar. Finish. There you go. Now I can move this. So here's my uh, preview window, an edit window for my um, Snagit recording. I can play it making an assignment in Canvas. I can, if I want to, uh, Adamo, I think it was, I'm not sure it was you or who asked about cutting something out of the middle of the recording. Camtasia, that no problem. That was, that was me, David. Ah, um, I want to cut out a piece in the middle. Bingo, it's gone. I can bring it back with an undo, but I can do all sorts of tricks like that. I can um, I can add special effects. I can zoom. I can zoom in and out on things that are hard to see. I can put. I can stitch screencasts together with other video, or I can stitch two screencasts together on the timeline. Can you preview I what can, you're cutting? 
I'm sorry? Can you preview what you're cutting out? Yes, absolutely. And we're not using an external tool like my whatever, like that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, good question. Um, obviously, the interface is a little more complex than the other ones we've been looking at because it can do so much more. Compared to most video editors, though, it might take you a good dedicated day to learn Camtasia. If you're going to learn Adobe Premiere or um, Final Cut Pro or the Avid Professional Video Editor, it takes a lifetime to really learn everything about it. This is so much simpler than, than most video editors, yet it has a great deal of the same power that you have in these prof truly professional video editors. This one I would rate as semi-pro, but I will guarantee you it's got, it'll do everything I've ever needed to do in a video editor. I have, I can count on my fingers and toes the number of times I've actually had to use something more complex than Camtasia to get an instructional video in the shape I wanted it. But this does give you tremendous um, post, what's called post-production capability. You can really spiff up the video. I can superimpose videos on top of one another. I can play multiple videos that I can play them at the same time. I can do green post-production chroma key, a uh, green screen effects. So I could have myself standing in front of this screencast and talking about it while I'm, while I'm recording it. And pointing at things on the screen. So, oh yeah, there's the, you know, do that right there. It's on my finger and so on. It takes a little, believe me, that's not as easy as it looks on the evening news with the weather person. You add in. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can you add into where you are, where you just deleted? Can you add in another piece of film? You sure can. Okay. You can do what's called AB, an AB roll. Let's say I wanted to add something in the middle. Of, well, I can, as long as you've got questions about Camtasia, I'll answer them because I love this software. But I can split the clip here into two clips. Okay. And then I could take another video. I can That's add video, wondering. import media. Obviously, I don't have time to really show you how to right. do this clearly, but I will tomorrow because tomorrow's uh, two to four, I'm going to be talking about just about Camtasia. Okay. So that I, was, I have lots people. of things. Great. And, uh, and I'll be recording that too. So if you can't make yeah. it, um, let's say, uh, thank you. Let's say I want tater in here. I can just select that video, open it. I can add that to my clip bin here and I can bring that down and I can put it in between these other two video clips. I can drop it right on that timeline or I can, I have multiple, it's a multi-track editor too. It's, it's got all the bells and whistles you expect on a video. Editor. So okay. I can be a tool like my whatever lab from the publisher. <laughs> We can have a break. <laughs> Thank you. That's what I wanted to find out. <laughs> Perfect. And That's I do my... want a submission, so it's going to be an online submission. That's my stupid terrier and my automatic lawnmower, my robot lawnmower. I'm <laughs> going to. Uh, Thank you. Oh, which one's dumber, the dog or the lawnmower? Actually, the lawnmower is quite smart. The dog, no hope. Anyway, yes, you can do all. Most of the things you see done in movies and on TV with edits, you can do in Camtasia. And you can figure out how to do it without spending the rest of your life learning it. It is really, a, as this kind of software goes, it's the simplest one I've ever seen to use. Yet it has tremendous power. The software is supposed to either be hard to, uh, easy to learn or easy to use, and never both. That was in the early days of software. And somehow TechSmith manages to make Camtasia both easy to learn and easy to use. I don't know how they did it. One theory says they sold their souls to the devil. 
Uh, I'm still waiting to see. <laughs> see if any of my friends vanish in a puff of sulfurous smoke someday. But it is, it's a marvelous tool. And that's all I have time to say about it right now. I appreciate the indulg your indulgence in doing that, allowing me to do that. Now I want to make sure I have answered your questions. I know I answered the question about creating an assignment in uh, Canvas because we made, a, we made a screencast showing how to do that. And it's on YouTube. You, I can send you the link and you can view it again anytime you want to. That's the power of screencasting. What are they charging uh, for Camtasia these days? I used to own, uh, I, I have a CD version of it from about 10 years ago. Uh, what's yeah, that one's that? getting a little long in tooth. I've got that one too. <laughs> but you can, ha uh, you can have this though. It's not insanely expensive. Oops, that's the wrong screen. Let's, that's what I want. If we go to Camtasia, the uh, Educators retail educated. price on Camtasia is a little steep, but the education price is about half, a little, less, a little over half that, 169. And I guarantee you, if you make more than five screencasts in your life, Camtasia will be worth it. Dave, are you going yes. to cover how we do the recording and now, I know how to record, but uh, how, where it goes and how I would put it on YouTube, uh, specifically for Zoom. We didn't Zoom. spend much Zoom. time yeah. on it. I'll be happy. Yeah. Be happy uh, to do that. Tomorrow? Yeah, so. Are you going to do that tomorrow? Oh, no, I'll do that right now if you like. Oh, yes, yes, please. Okay. That's, <laughs> that's what I joined this webinar. That, uh, very nice. Okay. Yes. Okay. When you. I'll have to talk you through some of it because again, I can't show you my Zoom screen and my Zoom menus and so on. The Zoom just doesn't work that way. And yes, no problem. I know, I know that. But you understand. Yeah, okay. I know. I, though that. I do have a screencast <laughs> of how to do that on our sdccdolvid.org, our on demand video site at the district which Katie Palacios and I put up, yay, these many years ago. When I still had short hair and uh, she wasn't middle-aged. And if anybody says I've said that about her, I'll, <laughs> she'll kill me. So I don't do that. <laughs> I will do uh, it. Oh, I thanks do. a lot. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, she's actually, yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> Just depends on where you draw the line. Katie and I He's worked amazing. together for a long time. We started the, the district two weeks apart, and she was she's the best coworker I've ever had in my life, and the best screencaster I know. She's amazing. I I showed her how to screencast for the first time. I'll take credit for that. But she very quickly, the pupil very quickly outstripped the mentor in that case. And she's, some of her videos have been, uh, some of her screencasts have been featured at uh, conferences by TechSmith. Uh, she's that good. I mean, she is a, she's just amazing at this. Mm -hmm. But um, so she's a great, if she, if you, if you teach at Mesa, she's a great resource on this. Better than I am, seriously. So um, on this site, there is a, um, you can search for Zoom recording. It's the easiest way to find it. And everything I'm about to show you is right here. Recording to your local computer in Zoom and loading the recording onto YouTube. I'm gonna to try to compress it a little bit because I think it's, I don't know how long it is, let me see. Forget about 50, about 14 minutes, something like that. I think I can do a little better than that uh, because I don't have to show everything here. But anyway, that's always there when you need it. So um, let's go to, uh, so when I click record, 
in Zoom, I always record, take the option to record to my local computer. Does it automatically give you the uh, uh, option what, when you click the record? Not necessarily. That's a very astute question. Um, let me get to my profile here in Zoom. So I, I changed that uh, on my profile, asked it to do local, and it just oh, doesn't good. go. No, it doesn't go there for some reason. They just uh, sent well, me they just sent me a, an email with a link, and I don't know how to put the link on YouTube. Yeah, it's so it's it's recording to the Zoom cloud. Do you have a confer Zoom Pro account? Yes. Darn, you should be able to do it because what I was going to show you is the, under the recording tab here on your meeting settings or your Zoom settings. Oh, okay, settings, meeting settings. Is that that's uh, on Zoom or confer Zoom or does it matter? That it doesn't matter. Zoom.us will get you there. Confer a uh, CCC confer.zoom.us and zoom.us are really the same website <laughs> so uh -huh. it's just a two different urls pointing to the same thing you can just go to zoom.us okay. and, and sign in you'll have to sign in with your credentials and i i've obviously already done that here and then just go to the settings tab in your account screens yes and go to the recording settings not the meeting settings, but the recording settings. Okay. And the first option is local recording. And you turn that on. Blue is on. Once you uh, <coughs> do that, when you record, when you uh, mouse over the record button in Zoom, you'll get two options, record to Zoom Cloud and record to local computer. Okay. And you could select either one. Mm -hmm. But this, this has to be said in the Confer Zoom accounts, and it's not true in the Zoom Pro accounts, but in Confer Zoom accounts, this is turned off by default. You have to go in and change that because apparently they want you to record to the Zoom Cloud. And then they tell you, and then in the same breath, they tell you, well, you know, you probably shouldn't leave your stuff up there too long. You should download it and put it somewhere else too. To which I say, let's just put it somewhere else to start with, <laughs> put it on YouTube. But that's, you know, there's a lot of personal preference in that too. But this should allow you. And if you watch that video that I just showed you, that shows the option popping up when you mouse over the record button, shows what it should look like. I that's just can't what share I that. Thank you. That's very helpful. Good. Okay. So now my recording, when I get done with this, is going to go to my local hard drive. And it's going to be put automatically into a folder in my documents library, my default documents folder. And the same will be true on a Mac. And the folder will be called Zoom right there. If I open that up, this is going to look a little frightening because I've got a lot of Zoom recordings on here. So several years worth. Going back to the time my wife bought me this computer, uh, Christmas of 2017. So uh, I got a lot of Zoom recordings on there. But you can always find the Zoom recording you're looking for because the folder that contains your recording is um, uh, dated. Like this is the one we're working on right now, 0421, April 21st, started at 1.53 uh, p.m., 24-hour time. That's us. That's this one. Uh, here's yesterday's. There's, nothing, there's no recording in here yet because the meeting hasn't finished. But if I go to yesterday's folder and double-click, here's what the contents of that Zoom meeting recording look like there's an audio only recording in case you want to 
put it up as a podcast or something like that. The chat log is automatically saved. I think that is still a default in the Confer Zoom uh, accounts as well. I manually saved the chat a couple of times, so that's this file. These are just text files that show the chat log. Okay. This is a, I, I've never figured out what that's any good for, a playback file. Don't worry about it. But here is your actual video file with the soundtrack embedded. What of does it the say? Recording. It says zoom underscore zero, which is the um, uh, default file name for a Zoom recording. This is one of the things Zoom got gigged for because people were taking their Zoom recordings and they were uploading them to YouTube and they weren't changing. Uh, by default, the name of the YouTube video is the name of the file. So they weren't changing the name of the file and malicious people were able to search, actually not so much malicious people as people trying to write articles critical of Zoom, were able to search for those files on YouTube and they found thousands upon thousands of unprotected. And, and not only did the people who uploaded it to YouTube not change the name of the file, or the name of the, the change the title of the video, but they also left it public. So, duh, people were able to find it on YouTube and play it. Gee, that's not a security flaw in Zoom. <laughs> no. Oh, they should be protecting us from ourselves. Hogwash. I, I have an attitude about all this bad publicity Zoom's been getting. It's, it is just the best thing I, I like, I maybe like Zoom a little more even than I like Camtasia or Snagit. It's that good. It's the best, overall, the best multimedia tool I know. And it, and none of the others compare. Okay, i get off that soapbox again. Um, so anyway, that's the file you want to upload to YouTube or wherever you want to put it, YouTube normally. And I showed you how to manually upload a file to YouTube earlier. Um, I can go through that again, but I'd probably like to take a couple more questions first. Uh, and that is part of that tutorial, that screencast tutorial that I showed you on the um, uh, on our on-demand video site. Let me see, I've got that here somewhere. No, can you tell me how to get to that on-demand uh, at SDCCD? I sure can. Soon as I find it, <laughs> I know I've got it open here somewhere in just a second. Oh gosh, where did I put that? Too many monitors, too much stuff. There it is. The URL is sdccdolvid.org. Let me put that in the chat too. I'm so sorry. Can you go a little slowly? I'm writing it. SDCCD. You bet. SDCCD, San Diego Community College District. SDCCD, O L online, V I D video. That's how I remember it. SDCCD, O L V I D dot O R G, org. Oh, thank you so much. I have to. You are certainly thank welcome. You. And I am putting that in the chat tool as well. Okay. So it's you. there for you also. Okay. And there's, there's a lot of tutorials on Zoom, on Canvas, and other instructional technology uh, topics on here. And you can just search for the videos that you need by keyword, or we have menus up at the top, like the learning management system tutorials. We have our Canvas tutorials here and our, this is a new little um, series that I've put up of quick Canvas tutorials. The whole thing adds up to about an hour and it's every, just about everything you need to know, really need to know about Canvas to use it in an online course. So I tried to make those as compact as possible with the thought that after seven minutes, most of your viewers are gone. There's 
stuff on other academic disciplines here. Uh, we've got some basic student support information, and we have our workshop archives, which are all of the recordings of the Zoom sessions I've done, at least the ones I remembered to record, <laughs> are right here. There's one from uh, two days ago. The one from yesterday is halfway there. I've got it on YouTube, but I haven't put it in here yet. These are just links to YouTube videos, most of them. But there's one that we did on Zoom meeting security the other day. We haven't had any Zoom bombings today, so I haven't had to worry about that. But anyway, putting that up on YouTube is in that video that I showed you a minute ago. Zoom, uh, search for Zoom recording. There it is, recording to your local computer in Zoom and loading the recording onto YouTube. Okay. I have a question about the software that will take your video and automatically put it on YouTube. Is the default when it does that public or is it unlisted? Um, What's the default mode that it puts it in? In both cases, you get to pick. Okay. Uh, Screencast-O-Matic, let me see if I still have that up here. I think I closed those windows, darn it. Let me see. Ah, here they are, maybe. Ah, there's one. Oh, darn it, but that's a little bit further along. When you publish to YouTube and Screencast-O-Matic, there's an option there to choose your, pub, uh, your, your visibility, public, okay. unlisted, private, before you upload it. Okay. You can always go to YouTube and change that, but yeah. this will let you cho uh, choose it. In case of uh, Snagit, I can show you that. If I share to YouTube, ah, I think I have to go through this again. <laughs> Snagit, normally you would not run Snagit and Zoom at the same time. It's quite remarkable that you can do that that Zoom doesn't just crash. This, this was when I really fell in love with Zoom. When I, when they, I tried to break Zoom by having like three or four different screencasting tools, all recording at the same time while I was recording in Zoom and sharing my screen and sharing it potentially with the entire world. And Zoom would not break. It just kept on ticking. Okay. So with uh, the Snagit, you can choose your privacy level right here. Okay, got it. So you get to choose that before you put it on YouTube, but you can always go and change your mind in YouTube directly. Great question. Thank you. Dave, I just want to thank you before I leave. I'll see you tomorrow at the, the Camtasia session. Thank you so much. Fantastic. I'll look forward to it. All right, thank you, you Dave. Thank you. You're certainly welcome. Thank you. And one more thing, can I, can, oh, can keep, I get a keep link? Oh, the questions coming. Okay. <laughs> keep them can coming. I get a link to where I can do closed caption on my YouTube? I'm supposed, I'm taking the certification yes. course and we are mm -hmm. supposed to upload our video and make it closed caption and I've never done that before. There's exactly. a video on well, there. I have good news for you on that is that all you have to do to get your video closed captioned in YouTube is to upload it to YouTube. YouTube creates the captions for videos automatically. Oh. But your assignment, and I'm quite familiar with that assignment, <laughs> um, I've graded about a million of them over the years, also asks you to edit the captions in your short video so that they're more or less perfect. I don't always, I'll be honest with you, I don't always do that with mine because usually they're so good that there's no real need. But as a, a part of that assignment, they ask you to do that. And they won't give you full credit unless you do it. So you do have to know how to edit your videos in YouTube. And I am, I have, it's on my list of things to do to update our uh, YouTube 
caption editing tutorial that's on that site because it's a little bit out of date and YouTube changes that interface from time to time and it, it, you wouldn't be able to use it that tutorial now and I know Katie Palacios has made a new editing tutorial and I know she sent me the link in my email but I like all the rest of you all I am experiencing uh, the uh, still experiencing the fallout from that power outage that they had at the Miramar Computer Center, the District Computer Center the other night. And I can't search my email for it right now. And I'd, it'd take me way too long to find it. So I'm just going to show you real quick, if I may. And it'll be part of this Zoom recording too. At about, <coughs> gee, um, we started the recording right after two o'clock, uh, maybe 2.10. And it's 4.32 now, so it'll be about two hours and 20 minutes or so into this recording, in case you want to come back and look at it before I get it up on the, the on-demand site. But the process of editing your captions in YouTube is really pretty simple. Um, you just go to the detail page for your video that you've just uploaded, which you can get to, again, by just going to the um, to your channel video list and mousing over that video and selecting the details icon, the little pencil. And on that details page over here on the left is a menu. And the last item in that menu is subtitles. Uh, subtitles and captions are not exactly the same thing. <coughs> but the terms are usually used more or less interchangeably. So what's on YouTube are in fact subtitles and not captions, but that's an academic distinction. It doesn't matter. The, the video is still accessible. It still meets legal standards. So to edit those subtitles, I can click on this link here, the captions, whatever you want to call them. And you get a, a two line, if the captions have been created automatically, sometimes it takes a little while for them to show up. But if, once they've been created, you'll have this line that says English automatic. And another line that this is just where you can tell um, YouTube what language your video's in, but it detected that here, it knew that. And I can then take this go out this line that says English automatic and go to the end and there's a little menu button out here. Google could make this interface a little more intuitive. I under, I bet. And every time they change it, it takes me half an hour to figure it out again. So, but this has been, it's been this way for a while. So I click on this, these, this menu button. That's uh, the three vertical dots. That's the Chrome, the Google menu button vertical ellipsis. I click on that and I get an option to edit the captions. Don't worry about classic studio, just edit the captions. So we come up and we get a, um, a preview window of our video. Oh, it's black right now. Oh, that's right, because the first few frames of that were black. <laughs> It's because it was a bad video. Okay. Then there's an edit button here. And this should say edit captions. I guess they cost them too much to electricity to put that up there. I don't know. This is to edit the captions. So you click the edit button. And in a few seconds, the captions will appear over here. There's not very many because this video is only... 29 seconds long that there's a lesson in creating your uh, uh satisfying that assignment in your uh, canvas training course make your video really short mm. <laughs> that'll that'll make editing the captions a lot quicker this is and this is another reason for keeping your screencasts short as well because the longer they are the if you do have to do some caption editing, because maybe you use a lot of highly technical terms that aren't part of standard spoken English, 
and you have to go in and fix those terms. If, the longer the video is, the longer it's gonna take you to fix that. But fixing it is, while can be a little tedious, it's very easy to do because you see the captions right here. If you're like me, you can't remember what you said, so you have to play the video to see if the captions match the, the uh, speech. All righty, just doing a little test recording to the cloud here. Just want to see. I've got some background noise in that too. This is a real stinker of a video, but the basics were, it got every word. So maybe I'll put a capital A in there. Righty is what I said, <laughs> and it correctly identified it. Now it tells me, well, that's not a word, stupid. Okay, I've, I've got a thick skin. I can, I've gotten a lot of insults from YouTube over the years. I can handle it. Just doing a little test recording to the cloud here. That was the end of the sentence, period. All I had to do was put in a cap and a period. And I just keep doing that. All righty, just doing a little test recording oh, to stop here. This is working, check, check, check. Uh, gonna do just a couple of minutes of this. And again, even with the background noise, confusing it, potentially confusing it, it hit every word. That was more or less the end of the sentence. And it got the I and I'm capitalized. So that's all you have to do is you just work your way through the video and edit the captions in these in this text box here. And when you're done, you save the changes. And the trick here is that even if the captions, when you look at them in YouTube, are appear to be perfect. They're gonna the people who grade the question are gonna know whether you went in and at least did a little bit of minimal editing by putting in some caps and so on, because it displays slightly differently to them. They can tell whether you edited the captions or not. They can't tell how many of them you edited. <laughs> they can just tell you opened up the editor, did one edit. And change, and then saved it. <laughs> so if you don't want to edit the whole thing, you can get away without it. Dave, maybe you're supposed I'm to. I'm giving delete. away all our secrets here. You're mm -hmm. supposed to delete the automatic. No, this overwrites the automatic cap. No, no. In the assignment, they ask you to delete the automatic one. No. Ah. Oh, I suppose you can do that. Actually, I'm not even sure you can do that. You can unpublish them. No, there's a way. YouTube will automatically use the um, edited captions. It will not use the automatic captions. Once the edited, once they've been edited, it will use the new caption track every time. So there's no need to do that. That's all I can tell you. So uh, I honestly don't know. Well, I guess I did delete it there Un by unpublishing the automatic captions. But there's no need to do it. They can sit there. You might need them if you botched an edit. You might need them later. So. Do whatever you need to do to get full credit for that question. But in your own videos that you're using, don't delete the automatic captions. They will not cause any problems, and you might be glad you had them someday. And that's one thing I do know more about than anybody who wrote that course. So uh, I can't say that about much in that course, but that I can say it about. Video and screencasting has been my thing for, I did my first screencast in 1992 using a VCR and a, and a something, a device called a scan converter that converted 
computer video to TV video. And I recorded it on VHS tape. So uh, I've been at this a while. Okay, how about some other questions? Thank you. You were awesome answering questions. I well, that's what I'm. That's the best part of the session every time. Thank you for asking all those good questions. Thank you. Anything Dave. else? You're certainly welcome. Anything else I can do for you? Well, I have if not. Pardon, Jorge? Yeah, I have yeah. one question. Good. Yeah, that, this is nothing to do with this one, but uh, related to between no Comfort problem. Zoom, yeah, between Comfort Zoom and Canvas. When you schedule your meetings on a Canvas, uh, how can you transfer that meeting to Zoom meeting towards the uh, personal room? Uh, Person, meeting personal room is that what, what it is on uh, it not by default let's go look at that okay i can i can log into canvas as a different user i can't use the confer zoom stuff because i don't use my district account in canvas yeah. uh at least not as the default but uh let me get that up here Find, find out where I put Canvas, there it is. Okay, let me log out as administrator me. Okay. And log back in as instructor me. This is an instructor level account, just like the one you have, yeah. with no administrative mm -hmm. capability. All right. Now, let me just, I have to go into a course, so I'll just pick this one at random, and go to confer Zoom. Except I think I've hidden that here. Yeah, you, you did oh. it last time. Oh. Yeah, let me let me put it back for a second. Navigation, confer Zoom. There we go. Save. And now let's uh, refresh the screen to get that back. And now I can go to confer Zoom. Okay. Um, now, if no. you, I, go I ahead. Did, yeah, I did a schedule a meetings, uh, repetitive right here. meetings mm -hmm. for every Friday, but that meeting after I scheduled, it didn't show on my, on my Zoom account. It just mm -hmm. shows right here. Un unless I, I show, I press the prepare part because uh, let's assume that you make a room, uh, a meeting, and then you, you, you push the prepare, and then then enters. But if you don't push the prepare part, it doesn't transfer to the, to the well, room. Uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Let's try it. Let me just schedule a meeting here. <coughs> um, single daily meeting. Uh, let's see, today we'll do it at what's 4.45, let's do it at 4.50, that's fine. Uh, I'll just make it duration an hour, well, 15 minutes, that'll be enough. Um, hosted by me on conferencing account, and then save. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that meeting appears here. Yeah. All right, now that should show at zoom.us too. Uh, let's see. Let's see, my account, I am logged in as me. I, I use that same mm -hmm. login. I don't think that's gonna knock us offline, okay? But <laughs> just in case it does, I'll start up again in a second. Um, and go to meetings. Huh, I'll be darned, that does not show up here. That's that's what I have the issue for it. But 
when you go back and, and prepare the, the, the meeting, then pops up on this end. Then it pops up. Yes. Yeah, that's, a, that's apparently a, um, a glitch in the Confer Zoom app. That's curious. Huh. I never, I never tried that. That's interesting. Curious. Okay, in that event, okay, I can get the details. Yeah. And there's the session ID, which you need, or the, uh, yeah. So in order to act, if you, let me go back to the event calendar. In order for your students to get into this, then they have to get into it through. Uh, they, were, they were only able to, to, to come into to Canvas. They couldn't come in through. Uh, right, right. Yeah. They have to go in through Canvas. That sucks. Yes. That's just another reason in my book for not using this. I know you repeated, um, but uh, somehow I made a mistake, so I, I scheduled those meetings. Oh, yeah, I understand. I understand. I have used it myself. So the students have to access it from here. Yes. Which, as long as your Confer Zoom app is working, there's, they will be able to use it too, because it's your account that yeah. governs whether it works or not. So. Yeah, so they're just going to have to access it that way. You could send them the meeting ID. Okay, how's that? Right there. Okay. But that's going to be different for every meeting that you schedule. I know that's, that was my first mistake. I made it to before. Well, that I wasn't your mistake. That's not your mistake. That's the people who built this app's mistake. Yeah, because that's not yours. Yeah, because uh, we, end, we end them up on different rooms. After there is a way where you can force the Confer Zoom app mm -hmm. to use your personal meeting ID. Okay. You can go to your account screens in Zoom. Okay. I, I think this will work. I know it works if you schedule a meeting through the Zoom website. Let's try it and see here. Um, if I go to settings, mm -hmm. Zoom account, and this works exactly, this is a confer Zoom account, as a matter of fact, that yeah. I'm in. Okay, you you've got, them. not too far down from the top, you've got two settings. Use personal meeting ID when scheduling a meeting and use personal meeting ID when starting an instant meeting. Yes. Those are the only two ways to start a Zoom meeting, schedule it or start it instantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have those. If you on, set those, them, you have those set. Yeah, they're on both of both of them are on. Come to think of it, yeah, I do too. And yet, when you schedule through Confer Zoom, it ignores those. Yes. Mm. So your students are running the risk of ending up in the wrong room if they don't keep up with your announcements. Well, and know to go to the Confer Zoom app and join the meeting. Yeah, the, the reason why I, I scheduled through that one because I listened to them because they said what the, the other professors, they were asking them to come through uh, yeah. Canvas, which was easier for them. And uh, so we end them up on different rooms. And they say, if yeah. you use the Canvas, it'll be a lot easier for us. So that's how I scheduled. But then when I came and double check, see if, if, the, uh, if the schedule hours was popping up, boom, I didn't have on there, on the Zoom. Yeah, yeah I hear you. Well, it does show in the Confer Zoom app in, in Canvas, at least. Yes. This will be there. Uh, um, so you can always go and look at it there. But that I had not tried that. That I did not realize. I thought it was using my personal meeting ID, but that's not it. Yeah. Shoot. I'm going to look into this a little more and see if there's any way to fix that. Because I... But I, like I say, I refuse to use this tool anyway. Yeah, you, you uh, mentioned several times already, and I scratch why I didn't listen to him. But uh, now, 
Since no. we're on well, here. but this, it will work. I mean, yeah. as long as it's working for you, I wouldn't worry about it. Okay. Except that your students do, with a different ID every time, your students run the risk of just, well, as long as they enter and the meeting through Canvas, through the Confer Zoom app, they'll be okay. They shouldn't end up in the wrong place. Unless okay. they pick the unless you have several meetings scheduled and they pick the wrong one. <laughs> oh no, that was the only one. But right? they, that's you know that you can't worry about mm -hmm. that. So, yeah. Um, hmm. Well, I just learned something again about that app that I hadn't seen before, because I had been assuming that it was using because I had told it to do so that it was using my personal meeting ID and it's not doing that. Mm -hmm. Now, since we are on campus and you created that uh, assignment about it, how was your summer vacation? Right. How, how can you grade that one? Or you, can you still use the, uh, the, speed, uh, the speed grading? Oh yeah, you have to use the speed grader. Okay. If, a student, if the students turn in something on Canvas, you'll grade it in the speed grader. And that's true whether it's a homework assignment, or like an essay question in a test, or a gradable discussion. All of those are graded in the speed grader. Okay. And you get to that by just going to, you know, finding the submission icon in the grade book, okay. clicking on the icon, clicking the right arrow that pops up, All right. and I'm then following. selecting the speed grader from the okay. panel that comes in from the right. Yes. Just select speed grader, and there it is. This, these are all um, objective questions. So normally Canvas would have just put the grade in, but it explained right here that the quiz has changed since this submission, I've, I've been playing with it and I edited it apparently. Oh, okay. So it wanted me to look at it again. That's why it threw that icon up there instead of the number. I said, you better check that and make sure that the answers are all still right and that you the an appropriate amount of credit has been awarded. Uh, so it's, it's just looking after the students there. And then of course, when you're finished, you just submit. And, uh, then the little icon will go away and the number will pop up. Okay. But yes, you use the speed grader to grade everything. And the easiest way to get into it is through the grade book mm -hmm. by just looking for the little icons that indicate, well, it didn't change that. Shoot. <laughs> uh, sometimes Canvas gets stubborn too. And that should have changed. Uh, but the um, you just look for those little icons in your uh, grade book. There's one, and you just grade it through the speed grader. This apparently has had a new attempt. So, mm -hmm. so the. Uh, um, the speed grader is your grading interface for everything. All right. Okay. I guess that's pretty much your just you and me today. <laughs> okay. Everybody else. Well, if you think of anything else, just email me. Yes, I do. And, and, thank I'll... For, and thank you for all the help you're giving me. Oh, that's you, what you, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, you're walking you're walking me through all this blind at full uh, uh, I'm so glad. Patrick, well, Patrick, you're doing Patrick. you're doing great. You found out something about the about that confer Zoom app that I hadn't seen. So, nice job. Okay, thank you, sir. Take care, Jorge. Okay, bye bye. Have a great day. You too.